it gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce this talk. Uh, John Bass was a good friend, somebody that I've uh, really for years and years, for most of his uh, professional life. And John was a unique person. He was a very intelligent. Uh, he uh, was a scholar, and his scholar had was with a real inclusive and broad portfolio that he was an expert in a number of areas, internal medicine, pulmonary disease, and tuberculosis, but not just that. It included poetry, liter literature, music, history. He was really a, a man for all seasons in a lot of ways. And uh, he turned out uh, not just to be a scholar in music, but a great banjo player. Uh, I don't know if any of you know where Sand Mountain is, but it's in uh, North Alabama, and many of the great country music stars have come from that area. There seems to be just a unique uh, group of uh, genes over there with a lot of music ability, and we've really benefited from that. Uh, the other thing that I think is very important is John was just plain fun. We all enjoy John. He was a great person to be around, and <clears throat> I think you'll find from this talk, um, uh, I think you'll have fun with this as well as learn something. Uh, so I, without any further ado, let's, uh, let's go ahead and see John in this new presentation. The people who have died of tuberculosis that I'm really not going to talk about. I'm going to talk about a lot of others, but it just illustrates the breadth of uh, the history of this disease. There's, if you're not interested in somebody on that list, you're not interested in much of anything. And just the uh, Doc Holliday's there, Gerda's there, Tom Fogarty of Creedence Clearwater's there, uh, Christy Matthewson, who was pitchers for the Giants, New York Giants, a century ago. First 300 game winner, once won both games of a double header, pitching the first game left handed and the second game right handed. Man, it's don't make them like that anymore, you know. Oh. Uh, 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 Jimmy Rogers, the singing brakeman, the blue yodeler, and I will say a little bit more about him at the end. And then the special, the one that uh, I'm kind of fond of, the last one I've added to the list is Gabriel of Prince. Anybody know who he is, who that guy is? Chance. He's the guy that assassinated Archduke Ferdinand in Sarajevo and precipitated World War One. Man and cows go way back. In some traditions, back to the beginning. In Teutonic mythology, which comes down to us largely through the operas of Wagner and the Icelandic Eddas, <laughs> the beginning occurs when the warm wind from the south hits the frozen north, forms I Emir the giant, uh, grandfather of Odin, and Adulama the nourishing cow. The earliest know. art we have of man is also of man and what? cows. This is one of the cave paintings from Lascaux. This is from the inner sanctum, the Holy of Holies, showing the sacred bull of the hunt and the hunter, who does not seem to be doing all that well in this particular illustration. This early association of man and cows probably accounts for this. These are the skeletal remains of a Neolithic man from approximately the same time as the cave paintings at Lascaux showing the typical gibbous deformity of spinal tuberculosis. At this time, probably all tuberculosis for practical purposes was bovine tuberculosis and occurred in cows. The uh, tribes of men were not large enough or confined enough to sustain an airborne droplet nucleus infection. Cows have an additional very efficient means of transmission through infected milk, which commonly contains 10 to the 10th to 10 to the 11th organisms per milliliter. <laughs> the differences between the strains of mycobacteria that we call MTV hominis 
and Mycobacterium bovis are very small to the extent some of you may be in the laboratory, and you will realize that our molecular techniques right now really won't distinguish between, between those two organisms. This is Hathor, goddess of music, the night skies and beauty. This is Amenhotep II, Pharaoh at Thebes. Milk was used ceremonially by the Egyptians, probably accounting for the extraordinary incidence of tuberculosis that's been found in Egyptian mummies. The, the last count that I have is 38 Egyptian mummies have had tuberculosis uh, PCR out of them. The strains were mostly Mycobacterium hominis rather than Mycobacterium bovis or Africanum. Uh, and in actual fact, M. bovis has gene deletions from M. hominis, so that probably the bovine strain evolved later, but the disease was one of cattle at this time. This is the mummy of Nesperhan, priest of Ammon. At Thebes. Nesperhan has more evidence of tuberculosis than any of the Egyptian mummies that I'm aware of. You can see the densely calcified left pleural rind. There is a very impressive gibbous deformity here that would show up better in the lateral projection. And there's complete effacement of the right psoas muscle from a psoas abscess or retroperitoneal tuberculosis. And these forms of tuberculosis probably illustrate the way it was acquired from ingestion of milk so that it was acquired through the gastrointestinal tract and largely involved the retroperitoneal space with skeletal tuberculosis and with psoas abscesses. Another very common form of ancient tuberculosis, which is now rare, and which was probably also acquired by ingestion of infected milk, is tuberculous cervical adenitis or scrofula. This is a scene from the Egyptian Book of the Dead, showing the crucial moment in the journey to the afterlife. This is the weighing of the heart against the feather of truth, presided over by Anubis and recorded by Thoth. There are two interesting onlookers to this ceremony. One is the crocodile-headed monster, Amit, which will devour the heart if it does not measure up. And the other is the winged spirit of the mummy, Ba or Ka. It was necessary for the spirit to accompany the body throughout the journey to the afterlife and the crucial moment was the weighing of the heart against the feather of truth. It did not measure up. The journey was not completed. Now, it's not clear that the Egyptians had a tradition of danger from spirits that were let loose because the journey was incomplete. Nevertheless, those of you who may be fans of Anne Rice will recognize that she takes her vampire lineage back to Akasha, the queen of the damned at this period of time. <clears throat> in uh, ancient Israel, there probably <clears throat> was not much in the way of tuberculosis. The Hebrew scriptures don't really mention much that sounds like tuberculosis. Uh, probably because they did not use cows and cow's milk. The, the, their oxen were beasts of burden rather than sources of food. Milk, if they had used it, would have been goat's milk. And uh, meat, if they ate it, was, was mostly lamb. So there probably was not a lot of transmission of tuberculosis in ancient Israel. This is the plague at Ashdod, uh, which was sent on the Philistines, in retribution for stealing the ark. And since it's described in Samuel as being accompanied by swellings, it probably was the bubonic or the black plague rather than tuberculosis or the white plague. This is Hippocrates. 
The statue you used to seeing of Hippocrates is from a better-looking fellow who was also a physician on the Isle of Kos about a century after Hippocrates lived, and his statue was usurped uh, because he was better-looking. Hippocrates recognized thesis, or gradual wasting. Uh, he described the pulmonary and the spinal forms of wasting, and it's possible that some human-to-human -human airborne transmission was occurring at this time. He confused the disease with other causes of infection at the same body parts. He described a number of our physical findings with terms that we still use. He used the word tubercle for nodules, but he didn't do any autopsies or internal dissection, so the only ones that he was able to see were the cutaneous tubercles of cutaneous tuberculosis. And Hippocrates agreed with Plato that the disease was hereditary, and there was a hereditary predisposition to gradual wasting. This is Aristotle. It's actually Rembrandt's painting of Aristotle contemplating the bust of Homer. Aristotle disagreed with his teacher Plato and thought that thesis or wasting was spread from one person to another. It's the first description of contagion that I'm aware of. Galen, the great prolific second century Greek and Roman physician wrote more than 500 books and we still have 80 of them available to us today. He based his books on animal dissection rather than human dissection and made a number of mistakes and he divided diseases into the humors and placed thesis or wasting into the phlegmatic humor which makes sense. Although, as we will see, in the great Romantic period in Europe, it will become a disease of the melancholy. Pulmonary thesis was well described, and again, it's possible that human-to-human -human transmission was taking place at this time. Galen agreed with Aristotle that the disease was contagious. And because of the reputations of Aristotle and Galen in southern Europe, the disease has always been considered to be a contagious disease. He prescribed rest and milk, interestingly enough, cow's milk. And he was well known for a number of specific potions for various maladies. And his most fa famous one was Theriac, which was simply a gamish of all his other potions. And at the time of his death, it contained 70 specific ingredients. The Greeks developed the first concept of spirits that might haunt living people. <clears throat> Their Lamia was actually not a spirit, but was a was still an alive human being who uh, <clears throat> had several children by Zeus. Hera, Zeus' wife, became jealous, stole the children, and Lamia went mad and began to psychically drain the life's blood from the children in the surrounding villages, a psychic vampire. They also developed the concept of revenants, returned corpses from the dead that could wreak havoc on the living by draining their blood. Shortly after Constantine moved the center of the Roman Empire to the east, the western part of the empire fell, a period that we know as the Dark or the Middle Ages. Uh, the Eastern Orthodox Church supported this concept of returned corpses from the dead which could wreak havoc on the living. And there were a number of official conditions which could lead to this. And one of them was excommunication from the church. And there are a fair number of recorded uh, instances where these returned corpses were causing so much difficulty in local communities that the church had to posthumously rescind the excommunication in order to bring things back under control. And it worked every time. It was uniformly successful. Uh, 
The Holy Roman Empire suppressed progress, and Galen's ideas were maintained unchanged for greater than a thousand years. Again, a period that we might call the Dark Ages. In the eastern part of the empire, cattle were important. They served as beasts of burden, as sources of milk and food, and they were an early version of uh, central heating in your home. The houses were built with the barn on the ground floor. The animals would be herded into the barn at night, and the people would sleep on the second floor above the animals, and their body heat would rise to, to keep the people warm. There are a number of well-described famines in Eastern Europe during these years that seem to be gradual wasting in herds of cattle followed or accompanied by gradual wasting in people. These are probably bovine epidemics of tuberculosis which are spreading to the human population because of both the proximity and because of the lack of food itself and malnutrition in the humans. <clears throat> and this concept of the vicolacus, the returned corpses that could drain life's blood, and the famine in the animals and the humans got combined in the minds of the Eastern Europeans and changed the burial practices. Up until this time, grave markers were totems that were placed at the mid-part of the grave. But because the corpses were coming back, causing epidemics and famines, headstones came about. Headstones are heavy, and they're placed over the head of the grave. And their original purpose was to keep the corpse from rising up out of the grave. In dire circumstances, additional measures could be taken. The corpse could be buried face down. There's the headstone, of course. Spiked in place, and you could do what the Egyptians had done, that is, leave things in the grave to try to interest the corpse in staying there rather than coming back. Western Europe never really developed these concepts of the Vrykolakis or the returned corpses. And the rumors that were emanating from Eastern Europe were now taking on Serbian terms, wampirs or vampires. But in the West, the idea was that death and pestilence and plagues were some combination of evil spirits that were not returned corpses plus the wrath of God. However, the description of these wampirs or vampires found their way into some of the Western paintings. This is a 13th century painting of pestilence when uh, it has many of the characteristics that we might associate with, with vampires today. This is a frontispiece from one of Galen's textbooks printed by Gutenberg's Press. So you can tell there's not been much scientific advance in greater than a thousand years. About the only scientific advance was that Galen the Frank, in the 5th century, had developed the ability to lay his hands on his subjects with scrofula, or tuberculous cervical adenitis, pray over them, and cure them. And it became known as the king's evil. And somehow he was able to pass this ability down to his succeeding <coughs> monarchs. And this is... Shakespeare's description of it. What's the disease he means? It's called the evil. A most miraculous work in this good king, which often since my here remain in England, I've seen him do. How he solicits heaven himself best knows. 
with strangely visited people all swollen and ulcerous, pitiful to the eye. The mere despair of surgery he cures, hang a golden stamp about their necks, put on with holy prayers and despoken to the succeeding royalty, he leaves the healing benediction. Charles II is said to have cured 17,000 of his subjects of scrofula by laying on of hands and praying over them. An amazing number. Of course, the printing press printed other things. This uh, was fairly well known. It was a pamphlet called The Mallet of Maleficence, better known as The Witch's Hammer, <clears throat> and described these manifestations of evil in humans uh, that were mostly thought to be due to separation from God. And vampires are in there. They're, they're described. But as I said, vampires never really caught on well in Western Europe. What did catch on was witches. There were a number of witch hunts in, in Western Europe. In the 16th and 17th centuries, Vesalius, based on human anatomy, corrected many of Galen's fallacies. An Italian physician, Proscatorius, described the theory that diseases could be spread by particles in the environment, which he termed fomites. I'm actually pronouncing that word correctly. It's not fomites. One of these things is a fomity. <laughs> At this time, consumption caused 20 to 25 percent of all deaths, and it was beginning to be pretty well agreed that thesis and consumption were different ends of the spectrum of the same malady. That is, thesis was gradual wasting and consumption was rapid wasting, but it really was just the speed of the wasting which separated them rather than different problems. Some more pamphlets. Dissertation on the historical philosophy of the chewing dead. The chewing dead free from their tombs. Dissertation on the physical nature of the blood-sucking corpses. Now, these are, were, I guess, sort of like the National Enquirer or Star or, <laughs> or something like that. This date here, 1732, keep that in mind. But at any rate, these were being circulated and were causing sort of an underlying concern in the general population. This is a painting from 1732. It's the plague at Marseille. Now, it's the black plague in Marseille, not the white plague. But remember, 20 to 25% of deaths underlying this are due to the white plague. We now have the grafting on of the black plague along with all of these pamphlets about the return of these dangerous revenants, which could be possible for spreading these terrible epidemics. What is there to do? This is the communal making of Galen's Theriac in the town Opera Hall. And Galen's Theriac now contained a hundred specific ingredients, but of course was completely worthless both against both the black and the white plagues. And so what is there to do other than take things into your own hands? <clears throat> Science of corpsology was not well developed at that time. So the rate of decay of a buried body was not clearly known. This is one end of the spectrum, again from Shakespeare. How long will a man lie in the earth ere he rot? And faith, if he be not rotten before he die, will last you some eight year or nine year. A tanner will last you nine year. <laughs> the other end of the spectrum, I couldn't find a contemporaneous quote, so I used this one from Oklahoma. He looks like he's asleep. It's a shame he won't keep, but it's summer and we're running out of ice. So despite not knowing, actually we do know now a little bit more 
because the law in New Orleans became one year and one day to use the temporary tombs down there. And when they, what they would do is they would, those St. Louis Cemetery, all of those above ground crypts, they would put a body in there, it would stay there for a year and a day, and they would push the bones back. And they were pretty much uh, decayed by then. Of course, you're in New Orleans without air conditioning, but... So despite not knowing really, uh, these are what we might call research criteria for discovering a vampire. Uh, you could look for disturbed earth. Tombstone might be knocked over. Footprints, and of course, animals are dramatically better than humans at detecting vampires. No question about that. And if you thought the grave looked like it might contain a vampire, you could exhume the corpse. And you could look for open eyes, a ruddy complexion, the growth of nails after death, lack of decomposition despite the clown's opinion in Hamlet, blood around the mouth, and the bottom line, which was shrieking and gushing forth blood when you staked them. That was it. If they... If they shrieked and gushed forth blood when you staked them, that was a vampire. Which implies that that was the preferred method of destroying a vampire, and that's actually true. Burning is popular in Anne Rice, but it's hard to do. At this time, they did not have crematoria that got hot enough to actually completely burn up a body. So it was <clears throat> sort of like pit barbecue. And if anything, a charred vampire is even more disgusting than, uh, than a regular one. <laughs> so staking was the way to go. You could cut off the head or cut out the heart. Those were very effective, but most people didn't like to do that. Using these criteria, there are a number of documented vampires, real honest-to-goodness vampires. Peter Plotowitz slowly wasted away. His family began to slowly waste away. The animals began to slowly waste away. The townspeople began to slowly waste away. Peter was exhumed, staked, shrieked, gushed forth blood, and the epidemic was over. Arnold Paul, Peter probably died of tuberculosis of gradual wasting. Arnold Paul did not die of tuberculosis. He fell off of an ox cart and broke his neck. But he had served in the Serbian army, and uh, when he returned, told the townsfolk that he had been in contact with the Greek vampire there, and that he was certain that after he died, he would become a vampire. And sure enough, after he died, gradual wasting began to occur in his family and the townspeople and the animals. And it caused quite a stir such that Maria Teresa sent her chief army surgeon to investigate the situation. And Johann Flickinger issued this report in 1732, the same year as the painting at Marseille, and the pamphlet about the chewing dead. Uh, and in this, in this report, he reports that there were 32 bodies exhumed, and 18 of them exhibited unmistakable signs of being a vampire. And they were all staked, they all shrieked and gushed forth blood. And the epidemic seemed to be under control at that period of time. However, he also said, said that Eastern Europe seemed to be awash with vampires and that they were rapidly advancing on the Austrian Empire and represented a danger to them. Well, that caused a problem. And so this man, Benedictine monk, <coughs> was assigned to, to make the reply, Dom Calme. It took him quite a while. He didn't just do it overnight. Uh, and this is a treatise on the revenants in body, 
those excommunicated, the vampires and very alike us of Hungary and Moravia. And in it, he said that there didn't seem to be evidence for vampires. But he also said there didn't seem to be any evidence against vampires. And so it was a noncommittal report which was widely criticized by practically all of the intellectuals like Voltaire. Meanwhile, in southern Europe, where the disease has been considered to be contagious for all of these years, 1,500 years, individual city-states begin to pass fairly restrictive laws because of the hypothesis of Frascatorius that the environment could be dangerous. This is one. The health of the human body shall not be harmed or imperiled by objects remaining after death of a person dying of thesis. In the 18th century, we have the Industrial Revolution. People are flocking to the overcrowded cities for employment. And this is probably the first time in history where we really have an environment that would be set up to sustain an airborne droplet nucleus disease. So prior to this time, although there may have been some person-to-person -person spread of disease, it was not as rampant as it became at this period in time. Consumption accounted for a quarter to a third of all deaths, and there was continued disagreement on how contagious it was, with Southern Europe insisting that it was a dangerous condition spread from person to person, and Northern Europe believing that not only was it not contagious and that it was inherited, but it was particularly likely to affect artistic and gifted people. This is what Dumas said. It was the fashion to suffer from the lungs. Everybody was consumptive. Poets especially. It was good form to spit blood after each emotion and to die before the age of 30. These are some characters in operas and novels that died gradually, beautifully, and peacefully of tuberculosis. So this was the notion in Northern Europe, it was a hereditary condition affecting gifted, sensitive people. And several of these made their way into the medical literature. Uh, <clears throat> Violetta and La Traviata became ensconced in German textbooks as uh, Traviata Schoenheit, the beautiful, wasted woman. Is a, a phys, in the physical diagnosis books for the diagnosis of tuberculosis. The same is true of Marguerite Gautier in Spain. They were actually listed in the medical textbooks as prototypes of people who had women who died of tuberculosis. It's best illustrated in the three great romantic poets from England. This is uh, George Gordon, Lord Byron. Byron did not have tuberculosis. But he said, I look pale, I should like to die of consumption. Because the ladies would say, look at poor Byron, how interesting he looks and I. He wrote several poems about vampires. This is one, the genre is the vampire. But first on earth is vampire sent, thy corpse shall from its tomb be rent. Then ghastly haunt thy native place and suck the blood from all thy race. This is Keats. Uh, Keats was a physician. This is a painting of Keats by his traveling companion, Joseph Severin. Keats was a physician, but he never practiced medicine. He came down with tuberculosis during his medical apprenticeship, probably contracted from taking care of his mother and brother who died of tuberculosis. <clears throat> so he decided to begin writing. He also wrote some poems. He didn't write any about vampires, but he wrote... I'm sorry, he did write some about vampires. Uh, this is a psychic vampire. It's my favorite one. 
although he wrote a poem called Lamia, uh, I saw pale kings and princes too, pale warriors, death pale were they all. They cried, the built on Psalms mere sea hath thee in thrall. So this is about a psychic vampire. Shelley heard that Keats had TB. Shelley also had tuberculosis. So Shelley invited Keats to come visit him in Italy. Even though the laws were restrictive, the climate was thought to be good. This consumption is a disease particularly fond of people who write good verses such as you have done. I think you would do well to pass the winter in Italy as long as you find pizza agreeable. And Kelly, <coughs> uh, Keats went, made it all the way to Rome. And uh, there one night, he had shaking chills, massive hemoptysis, and died. 21 Piazza di Spagna, you can go visit it today as the place of his death. Uh, he was, of course, Anglican and couldn't be buried within the city limits of Rome because he was a heathen, and he was actually buried outside in the unbeliever cemetery. Joseph Severn, his traveling companion, the one who painted the portrait I showed, showed you, wrote back about the restrictive laws. The brutal Italians have nearly finished their monstrous business. They have burned all the furniture and are now scraping the walls, making new windows, new doors, even a new floor. Shelley wrote this poem in the style of Keats, in memoriam to him after his death. This is Shelley. Uh, before he went to Italy, he spent uh, the summer at Lake Geneva, Switzerland. And uh, he invited Byron to visit him. And Byron came. One night, no doubt a dark and stormy night, they challenged each other to write ghost stories. Winner of first place, Mary's wife Shelley, who wrote Frankenstein. Winner of second place at the time, probably Byron, who wrote a relatively short sketch about a vampire. But the eventual winner of second place would go to this man. This is John Polidori. This is Byron's personal position and traveling companion. And he remembered Byron's sketch. And when he returned to London, he expanded it and grafted on some things and published the story called The Vampire in the New Monthly Magazine. Uh, it was published for reasons that are still unclear under Byron's name took about a month for Polidori to get to claim credit for the story and for Byron to disclaim credit for the story. And during that month, Goethe, who was the leading literary critic on the continent, said it was the best thing Byron had ever written. What Polidori did is take the vampire legend and graft the characteristics of Byron onto the vampire. So he was well-dressed, sexually powerful, and educated. So now we have a literary vampire that's interesting to read about. So not only is he returned from the dead to drain the blood, but he is dressed up like a dandy. <coughs> the vampire tradition now passes down through a number of people who wrote interesting stories about vampires, uh, but really gets down to Bram Stoker, who was another educated man in London who worked for uh, at the Lyceum Theater uh, for this man. And uh, he decided to do research for on his vampire, to write a more interesting tale. And he came up with this guy. This is uh, Vlad II, 15th century prince of Wallachia. 
Now, the lady who wrote this story and said he's Vlad the Third, I don't think that's right. I think he's Vlad the Second. But anyway, his dad was also Vlad. Uh, and his dad had been made a member of the Order of the Dragon by the Holy Roman Emperor for his part in defending the eastern part of the Holy Roman Empire against the invading Ottoman Turks. And so the father, Vlad the First, I think, uh, became Vlad Drak. So Vlad the Dragon, Vlad Drak. And his son, Vlad the Second, became the diminutive, Vlad Dracula. So this is Dracula, the, the 15th century prince of Wallachia. Now he was not a returned revenant, but he was a bloodthirsty guy. His other name was Vlad Sefish, Vlad the Impaler, because he liked to impale his victims. And uh, so using this, he had another interesting attribute, and he lived in a dark castle in a foreboding land. So now the combination of Polidori's educated, sexually powerful vampire plus the tradition of Transylvania and Dracula and castles gave us our quintessential vampire, Dracula. Bela Lugosi only got this role because Lon Chaney died before the movie was cast. The role was supposed to go to Lon Chaney. Lugosi was buried in his Dracula costume. The book, Dracula, Bram Stoker's book, published in 1896, was an enormous success. It had the impact at that time that the Da Vinci Code had several years ago here. And it was the talk of this town. This is a vampire-killing kit that you could have purchased in London at that time. It's a fairly well-made thing. See what it's got in it. This book box contains the items considered necessary for protection of persons who travel into certain little-known countries of Eastern Europe where the populace are plagued with a particular manifestation of evil known as vampires. Professor Ernst Bloomberg, respect, it's not clear he ever existed, respectfully requests that the purchaser of this kit carefully studies his book. So you've got to buy the book, too. <laughs> you, can't just, you can't just buy the kit. What's it got? A pistol? Silver bullets. Now, that's problematic because everybody knows that silver bullets are effective against werewolves, but they're not particularly effective against vampires, except in Brides of Dracula, where they work quite well. Uh, an ivory crucifix, powdered garlic, I don't know, wooden steak. Now, there's a good thing right there. So, <clears throat> But if you think about it, what is this kit? Well, it's a coffee table piece. It's a conversation piece, right? What person who could really afford something like this would go off by themselves at night into the mountains of Transylvania looking for vampires? It just doesn't make any sense. Tuberculosis has affected the arts. Uh, I'll show you several paintings by Rembrandt. This is The Blinding of Samson. The model for Delilah is Saskia, Rembrandt's wife. This painting was completed before they were married. They became married, and she slowly wasted away of tuberculosis over the seven years of their marriage. Their son also died of tuberculosis. He painted her many times. Here she is in Night Watch, probably his most famous painting. And it was commissioned by this guy, Banning Coke, who paid 5,000 guilders. These others were city militia people who paid 100 guilders to be in the painting, and none of them, by reports, were satisfied with the way they were portrayed. And this is Saskia. See, she already is wasted away and whiter than she was in the preceding painting. And here she is in The Woman Taken in Adultery, a painting completed after she died. So you can see how wasted and thin and pale she is. Traviata Schoenheit the beautiful, wasted woman.
Here's Greta Garbo, dying beautifully of tuberculosis in Camille. So this notion of thinness as an attribute of feminine beauty came about partly, at least, because of the romantic, romantic notion of tuberculosis and the kinds of people who were affected by it. So any of you women out there who are starving yourself half to death to have a Hollywood hot body like Sharon Madonna or Michelle have the romantic notion of TB to thank for your plight. <laughs> TB has affected the performing arts. This is Paganini, a virtuoso on the violin unlike any before and probably unlike any since. Uh, <clears throat> he was gone from lifelong tuberculosis. He was interested in making a lot of money. So he was insanely guarded about his techniques. He would go around and play and would pass out his music to the accompanying musicians and then would instantly take it up as soon as the piece was over. And he would never play the same piece of music twice in the same place. He was the Elvis of his day. He would play the sensuous music and would cavort around the room to hide what he was doing, and young women would faint dead away. And so because of this power he had over music and young women, because of his physical appearance of gauntness, and he was said to be in league with the devil. And the violin became the devil's instrument, something that a tradition that has continued, uh, <clears throat> especially in folk idioms. So the fiddle is the devil's instrument, the devil's dream, Satan's reel, Satan's horn pack, pipe devil down in Georgia. Uh, he was successful in making money. Uh, for one month, he played several times a week in Vienna, and made $600,000. That's more than the Rolling Stones made. Right before he died, he bought 11 Stradivarius instruments as an investment. He didn't play a Strad. He played a Guarnerius. Now, this is what the poet Heine said about him. That man brought into the arena at the moment of death like a dying gladiator to delight the public with his convulsion? Or is it one risen from the dead, a vampire with a violin, who if not the blood out of our hearts sucks the gold out of our pockets? <laughs> this is Chopin. I'm not going to say much about Chopin. We could talk for hours about Chopin and his trials and tribulations with tuberculosis. I'm showing him because he had an autopsy. He was one of the first people to die of tuberculosis who had an autopsy. He died largely of tuberculous pericarditis. His pulmonary disease was rather trivial. Lenach invented the stethoscope, and his book on the stethoscope has a hundred, hundred pages on tuberculosis based on autopsies, such as the one Chopin had. And he was the first to unify the various forms of the disease. He called the disease of t tuberculosis. Interestingly enough, he died of tuberculosis. His book on the stethoscope says that tuberculosis seems to be contagious everywhere else in the world, but not in France. And part of that notion, that lingering notion of a hereditary disease affecting gifted, sensitive people was still brought about by people like this. This is the Reverend Sir Patrick Bronte, father of the Bronte sisters, who all died of tuberculosis over about a seven-year period of time. The Reverend was never seen summer or winter, day or night, without this enormous cravat to cover up his draining tuberculous scrofula, which apparently had not been cured by the king. So this notion was that 
It was hereditary and affected gifted people, such that only 10 years before Coke discovered the germ, Elizabeth Barrett Browning, who probably died of tuberculosis, said, is it possible that genius is only scrofula? This is Coke. Discovered the tubercle bacillus in 1882. So everything I've said up until now is conjecture. There has been no proof that that's really what these people had without being able to recover the organism. Although it's been PCR'd out of the mummies and has been recovered. <clears throat> this is one of the first people to have his tuberculosis diagnosed by recovery of the germ. This is Anton Chekhov. Chekhov was a physician, but he didn't really like to practice medicine very much. So he would practice occasionally to make a little money so he could go back to writing his short stories and plays. And at this time of his death, at age 45, he had written of tuberculosis. He had written 600 short stories and plays and is generally considered to be the greatest short story writer of all time. <clears throat> he died at the tuberculosis at a hospital which took care of tuberculosis also in Badenweiler, Germany. And uh, they, the hospital did not want someone of Chekhov's stature and reputation to die in their institution. So they wheeled him out on the front lawn while, as he was dying. And he ordered a bottle of champagne, drank the bottle of champagne, and died. Now let's fly across the ocean to the New World very briefly. The New World has mummies with TB. This Peruvian mummy had TB DNA PCR out of it. The New World has vampires with TB. In fact, all of the New World vampires had TB. These were all exhumed, staked, shrieked, gushed forth blood, including these three women right here who exhumed, were exhumed 10 years after Coke discovered the bacillus. This is Edward Livingston Trudeau, great-grandfather of cartoonist Gary Trudeau. Edward Livingston was a physician with tuberculosis and was dying. So he decided to go to a place that combined the two most beneficial environments, at least based on rumors from Europe, and that is the mountains and the water. So he went to Lake Saranac in the Adirondack Mountains in New York. And this picture was taken three weeks later. He's on a hunting expedition. He was dead three weeks ago, and now he's out hunting. Remarkable renewal of vigor. He believed so much that the environment was beneficial that he established the most famous tuberculosis sanatorium in the world at Lake Saranac. And a number of famous people actually spent time at his TB sand. This is the first cottage of that sand, Little Red. This is someone we were talking about at dinner last night. This is Thomas Mann, uh, who won the Nobel Prize for Literature, and probably a great part of that uh, award was due to his book, The Magic Mountain, uh, which takes place at the tuberculosis sanatorium at uh, Davos, Switzerland. And it is a, an encapsulation of people from various parts of Europe whose personalities and political opinions led to the outbreak of World War I. It is a great book. It should be read by anyone interested in TB or World War I or humanity in general. This is my favorite writer. This is Walker Percy. Walker was a physician, but he never practiced medicine. He contracted tuberculosis doing an autopsy when he was an intern at Bellevue Hospital. He spent three separate stints at the Lake Saranac Tuberculosis Hospital. Thank God he didn't die. He published his first novel, The Moviegoer, at age 46, an age at which Chekhov had already died 
after having published 600 stories. Walker was finally treated when ice and ice became available in the 1950s. So we've only been able to treat this disease, the greatest scourge of mankind throughout all of history, for the last half century. This is someone who spans the old world and the new world continents and the pre- and post-chemotherapeutic era. This is Vivian Lee. Uh, we know her as Scarlett O'Hara and Lawrence Olivier's wife and, and all of that. Vivian Lee came down with tuberculosis during her first pregnancy in the 1930s and was placed on bed rest. Well, she recovered, obviously, from that. Uh, in 1967, she was touring the United States with a role in a play by Anton Chekhov. The play is uh, Ivan Ivanov. And she played a Russian peasant woman dying of tuberculosis. Uh, she began to cough. Began to cough so much she didn't have to remember to cough when she was on stage playing this role of this tuberculous peasant. Needless to say, she had reactivated her previously contained. Remembering that she recovered before and stating that she did not like the taste of the medicine, she refused to be treated. And she died three weeks later. I'm going to close with a, a song <laughs> by Jimmy Rogers, the singing brakeman. The, I showed him on the first slide. He, did, he died in the RCA recording studios in New York City. Uh, he went up there to record sick with tuberculosis, and he would record a song, go out in the hall and lie down on the cot, and as soon as he had recovered enough, he would go back and record another song. <clears throat> but one time he didn't come back, and he had died. He's buried in Meridian, Mississippi, if you want to go. To see his grave. <clears throat> Blues. 